What's up, guys? Tired of your InsureTech solutions coming up short? We've seen tech services that aren't industry-specific, just some tech firm slapping an insurance sticker on it, but not really understanding our business. We need an agency-centric solution. Technology is built by insurance pros for insurance pros to streamline our processes. A great example of that is ePay Policy. All these guys do is insurance. That's their only focus. They are a great go-to service for ACH and digital credit card payment processing that helps you bind policies faster, and they seamlessly integrate with a ton of management systems. Head on over to ePayPolicy.com, check them out, and use the promo code IGPODCAST to get your first month free. I don't know that Elon Musk is working on a self-driving insurance agency, but until he does, we've got ePay Policy. It's like being on autopilot. Flip the switch, lean back, take a nap. Let's go. Insurance agents from around the world, welcome to the Insurance Guys podcast. My name is Scott Howell, your fearless host and leader, insurance agency owner and insurance evangelist for I Protect Insurance and Financial Services based out of Huntsville, Alabama. And before we get started on today's episode, please help me welcome, he is a six foot three sophomore from Sarah Land, Alabama. Parade first team, all American rivals, five-star recruit. He is a fantastic insurance agent and a great American. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome the incomparable Mr. Bradley Flowers. How are you, Bradley? I'm great, Scott. How are you today? Best I've ever been, Bradley. I gotta tell you something. We can't go another minute without telling this story. Our guest today is from Tupelo, Mississippi, home of the free, land of the brave. And as you know, my alter ego is Elvis Presley. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, this is Elvis Presley. Now, can we go another second without talking about the story on December the 16th when I interrupted the podcast thought leaders podcast on agency intelligence as my alter ego elvis presley i remember that bradley there's a prayer there's only been about five or six people have this prayer there was a group of people on that whatever that was podcast that day and as i looked into their eyes i could see that they were going to pray this prayer that night the only other person i know that prayed this was my former nationwide sales manager and about to be a state farm agent. When my newest personal lines agent walks in and hands in her notice on January the 15th, she is going to have this prayer as well. And the prayer goes something like this, dear Lord, please. I have only one request in my life. Please allow Scott Howell to die from anal cancer as fast as possible. That's what, the, that's what some of those people looked like when I came on as Elvis that day. They were not excited, Bradley, at all. I think it was just confusing. <laughs> um, I, uh, I was having all kinds of internet issues that day, as I'm still having now, which is why I made you the host of this Zoom. But, uh, so I, w- I missed a lot of that and ended up having to, to drop out early, but I thought it was hilarious. So basically Cass does this jason Cass. all most of you guys probably know does this end of the year thing with all the podcasters it's the second year in a row we've done it and he had scott tell everybody he wasn't going to be able to make it which is disappointing because scott is the thunder and and then he came in as elvis presley surprisingly i thought ryan hanley was going to crawl under his desk ryan was thinking too i know ryan pretty well I I, i think there were two things Ryan Hanley was going through his head. Number one, what is this guy going to say? Because I, I know he was like, this is on Facebook Live, and there is no telling what's going to come out of his mouth. And I think he was a little embarrassed for me to be on as Elvis Presley. I think, because- I, I think the first one's wrong. I think it was a little bit of the second. But <laughs> I think I, what it was is, is Ryan – I think Ryan – we were having a very serious discussion about something. I know what it was. Like it was bad, a bad podcasting, bad podcasts. Maybe and, it and was pod, like a no, it was I a deep this morning, deep discussion, and it was right in the and Ryan was uh-huh. like hitting the crescendo of like the point he was trying to make. So it was almost like, and I know that feeling because I've had it before, not with you, but I'm like, oh my god, will this hurry up so I can finish making my point, or otherwise it's not going to be relevant? You know what I mean? I think that's what it was. So. And, and and as soon as I cut out. They were talking about like times they've had podcast guests that they couldn't put on, they couldn't air the podcast. 
as yeah. soon as I leave, Bradley goes, speaking of bad podcasts. Did I say that? Yeah, oh, you so did, sorry. you asshole. You sure did. You sure did. Hey, guys, we got a great show for you today. I'm excited to be here. Bradley Flowers is excited to be here. Let me tell you something. Anybody that lives 45 minutes from where I grew up, I'm excited and proud to have on the show. Let me tell you another reason I'm excited to have him. He has earned it. He has grown his business, started from scratch. He is in a situation now where he's building new offices. He's got lots of staff. He's growing his business. He's gotten successful. I love having those kind of people on the podcast. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, he was born, raised, and lives in Tupelo, Mississippi. He was honorably discharged from the Marine Corps in 2013 to start a career in insurance. Yut, yut. <laughs> he started going door to door, writing Medicare supplements and knew that there had to be a better way. My God, there had to be a better way. Early on, he had success using social media to generate leads, even though a lot of people said there was no way he could do this because of the people that he was selling to were not on social media. He did it anyway and wrote 72 policies in one week during the annual enrollment period in 2016. In 2018, he started documenting his journey on Facebook through a Facebook group called Medicare Gurus that has grown to over 5,000 members. He now has two offices, fully staffed, and is crushing it in the Medicare beneficiary game. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my profound honor today to introduce to you First time guest on the Insurance Guys podcast, Mr. Justin Brock. How are you, Justin? Thank you for having me, guys. I'm doing wonderful. This is entertaining just being here, and uh, I feel like I, I've always listened to you guys, and now I'm like watching you tell these stories live. It's it's uh, it's pretty uh, surreal. You know what's absolutely gold? What's absolutely gold is the and it's like this on every episode is the five minutes before we start recording and the five minutes after a lot of times those conversations, which a lot of them can't be made public. Those conversations are just as good and just as entertaining as the actual show. Oh yeah. <laughs> I think people wanting me to die of anal cancer is pretty entertaining. <laughs> anal. That's the scientific term. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Justin, I got so many questions, but before I get to you, Bradley flowers, yeah. Please tell us the funny story that happened just a few minutes ago between podcasts. So we were between podcasts and I walked out and we're in this, we're in this new office, right? And the first day we worked in here for the new year, which was Monday, which was January the 4th. We're recording this on the 6th. The first day back, we had a water leak in the office. Our internet went down bad and I smelled smoke in my office. <laughs> it was just an all-around bad day. Well, I'm walking through the office a second ago, and I smelled something. And I stopped, and I said, I smell something here. And I waved at one of my guys. I said, come over here. I was like, you smell? He's like, he's like, that's, I said, it smells like crap. Mm. Like not crap, like, like crap, crap. Right. Do -do. And then we look to the right and somebody is microwaving their lunch right there in the <laughs> microwave. And I said, sorry. <laughs> anyway, that was my fun story. Hey, I walked into my office over in Athens one day last year. And the only way I know to describe this was the entire office. As I opened the door and I took, because I take a lot of pride in how our offices smell. You know, you want it to smell like. That's important. It yeah, is. You, you know, Otis Spunkmeyer cookies or some kind of smell that when people walk in, they're like, man, that smells great. I love the way that smells. I open the door. I take one step in. And the only way I know how to describe it is the office smelled like foot and ass. That's the only way I know how to describe it. It smelled awful. There's the title of the episode. Right there. And I walk in and I go to the to the receptionist desk there's another person sitting behind her and i said i said guys can you tell me why our office smells like foot and ass right now same thing somebody had taken leftover curry and rice or something and microwaved it and it sm it took me all afternoon i had to open up all the doors on the perimeter of our building to get it out 
It was I bet awful. you, I bet you Justin knows the answer to this question. Do you know what smell? Because health and life guys like know this kind of stuff. <laughs> no, do you know? Because it's so hard to sell that stuff. Mm. You got to go into some rough you places. You have to know all the tricks, right? <laughs> do you know what smell has been scientifically proven to make people buy the most? Please state your answer in the form of a question. I know some, some things like this, like the color of a grocery store floor being red, but mm-hmm. what makes people hungry, stuff like that. The smell itself to be answer in general. What you, is, you want to guess or do you want me to tell you? Yeah, I'm gonna get I'm gonna let you go. Lavender. I feel like maybe I've heard Lavender Lavend- has been proven to make people buy more life insurance than other smells. Said. So go get you a lavender candle. <laughs> and spend more money at a strip club. Yeah. That's that's why all those girls have like sugar, lavender, they, and vanilla on. Is that why they named themselves Lavender? I don't think it works the same way. <laughs> now to the main stage. Destiny <laughs> Lavender. Destiny Lavender to the main stage. <laughs> Guys, we are proud to be here. It is a big day for me. It's a big day for Bradley. And I'm just proud to have a boy from Tupelo, Mississippi, that's done big on this podcast. And, Justin, let me just go ahead and break this down for you. Our job today is to move the ball one step forward to greatness for 250,000 insurance agents. No pressure. So let's get into that. Let's start with getting in my DeLorean and going back to those days in the Marine Corps when you got out in 2013 through your boots over the power line as you were leaving. Tell me what you did in the Corps and then bring us up to today. So uh, let's see. I, I joined the Marine Corps at 18, and I was an, I was an aviation guy. I was an air winger. I was an aviation operations guy. So I worked on different aircraft. I wasn't specific to one frame. I was with C-130s. I've been F-18 squadrons. I've been with uh, C-12 squadrons like VIP transport. I've been to... Kuwait, Iraq, Qatar, Ireland, Australia, Japan, all over the all over the Westpac area. So I got I did get to travel a lot. I had a, a good service record, you know, as far as getting to go places and not getting too jacked up. So I can't I don't have anything bad to say about my time. About seven, six, seven years in, uh, you know, I had a couple of kids and my, I was married, and it just wasn't you know the life to raise kids in because. I was gone all the time and you know, your kids would forget who the hell you are when you're gone for a little bit. So I decided I wanted to get out and I wasn't going to make it a career. You guys know if you stay in, if you stay in past 10 years, you're pretty much stupid not to just go ahead and do the other 10 and retire. So at eight years I got out because that's about the last time you can make a good, you know, educated decision to get out, you know, and uh, my dad was an insurance agent since uh, you know, and I saw him go through, a little bit of a climb in it and be able to provide a, you know, a good life for himself later on. You know, we went from, we went from when I was a kid, he was a carpet salesman at Sears when I was about 10 to by the time I graduated high school, you know, we were, he had put on a swimming pool and we could buy new cars, you know? So I saw that transformation. So I already had a good feel that the insurance industry rewarded people that worked hard. Now he worked really hard. I mean, he was, he was working all the time, but I saw it work and take you from poverty to middle class. Right. And so I had a, a good idea that, Hey, I don't have a master's degree. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a lawyer. I got a good service record an honorable discharge and a, the spirit to work hard. And so I thought it'd be a good industry for me to get into. And he had focused a little bit in the Medicare supplement arena. So I got out and started buying direct mail leads. Like I was saying, and going out and knocking on the door saying, did you fill out this card? I want to save you money on your Medicare supplement. And I was all clean shave, wearing my nun bush uh, penny loafer shoes with my slacks all dressed up, you know, and trying to get in the door like a Bible salesman. It worked. That worked. I, did, I didn't do bad doing that. But as I was doing it, I loathed the amount of, activity I was having to put in just to get that three, four, right. five sales a week. Right. And I was seeing people do big stuff on the internet, you know, mm-hmm. uh, in all kinds of different industries, real estate and 
direct to consumer Shopify style sales, all that kind of stuff. And, and my grandmother who was probably 80 at the time, she was on Facebook. Mm-hmm. She, she was on there more than I was. Right. And so everybody else still in Facebook was a waste of time. And I decided it wasn't and just started. I'm the kind of guy too. I don't know if y'all know these kind of guys, but you'll buy a course on how to do something. Mm-hmm. But you never even you you watch about three minutes of the course and you're like I got it, and then I just start trial and error in it because uh-huh. you know? I'm no, gonna learn it, it, the hard way. <laughs> it, I've I've been hit with, and I don't want this to go into like a super granular social media discussion because we've done that over and over. Yeah. But I've gotten that objection from my peers before. Yeah, and to that I say, you know how a 35 year old scrolls on Facebook like this. Yeah. scrolling on my phone very rapidly. You know how right. 60, 70 year old scrolls on Facebook? One, yeah. two, three. Yeah. yeah. So in a way, and I would bet you a 60, 70, 80 year old's more apt to click on an offer on social yeah. media than somebody's 25 and can tell it's an ad. No offense to anybody. Hey, hey Bradley, it. tell me if I'm wrong about this, but wasn't the time that Justin started doing this kind of coinciding with the time that Facebook aged up what, what with, that, with that age group, 2014, uh, 15, well, 16. I would say yeah. so. Yeah, absolutely. That so was around that, the time my mom got an account. There was some serendipity there because just about the time that you saw your grandmother getting on there and doing that, yeah. coincide i remember my mom getting on facebook around 2016 2015 somewhere in that so i think there was just some timing part of that too yeah well it, what you know what happened you know you started getting on there this is pre lead ads platform you know right. which we yeah. hit it big with that too but this is back when you would just put up i would i would literally just go on there and write about a policy you know hey we got a policy with, you know, X, you know, dental benefit. You can use this one at any dentist. There's no network. I'd hit kind of like some highlights Mm -hmm. and then I would, I wouldn't boost it. You'd go in. I would listen to this guy, uh, the art of paid traffic. He's a a podcaster is more of a digital marketing guy. I can't remember his name, Rick Mulready. But anyway, he had a thing. I would just listen to his podcast, honestly. And he was saying to run these post engagement ads, and I'd run post engagement to that elderly, you know, group and they would just like bombard me with comments mm-hmm. and I'd just be in the comments talking to all of them. Right. And then you'd get them in the, you'd message them and start messaging them and communicating. And it was, it's different than it is now, but you just get them dialoguing. And I mean, I was writing, I went from writing three, four or five policies a week, driving 50, 60 miles, one direction, 50 miles, the other direction. And all of a sudden I'm writing, you know, 25, 30 policies a week, not going hardly anywhere. And wow. Justin, isn't there a ton of regulation around Medicare and what you can talk about and how you can advertise? Yeah. So there's two different avenues on Medicare. You know, you got your Medicare supplement side and your Medicare Advantage side. Those are your two core products. Of course, there's other cross-selling products like ancillary benefits like cancer and dental and all that kind of stuff. But if you're advertising Medicare Advantage, there's a lot more stipulation on how you can and can't advertise um, because they those plans replace your Medicare while you're on them. So it's a little bit more uh, that's kind of brought me into the agent space more right. as, a, as a Medicare mentor. So talk to our agents here about how you went from where you were in 2018 to today you've got two offices you've got them fully staffed you've got good people working for you what was that transition like from you know we talk a lot on here about I had an old agent tell me one time he said Scott you got two choices you need to work in the business or you can work on the business one of the two it's hard to do both it's hard to bang the street and sell insurance every day and work on your business not saying it's not possible i know agents that do it but they do have a lot of support staff to help them how did you make this transition to 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 build a team have two offices what were some of your keys to doing that i mean there's a lot of 
tough transition there because as you are writing all the applications, you know, in the beginning, everybody wants to talk to you. And so you're having to forcibly remove yourself from the equation more and more over time uh, from that direct to consumer side of it and start to hire in and trust people. And I think delegate. you just have to delegate. You had to come to the realization that just because I don't believe somebody will do the exact quality job that I will, that I can hire enough of them and they can, I can train them to do as close enough of a job where I'm going to be better off in the long run, having people doing given, you know, even if they're at 90% of what my, what I feel like my capability is, that's still, you know, 90% replicably. Whereas me as a hundred percent is just one, you know, I can only do so much. And so it's a huge thing to hire people and begin to see that those activities replicated. And I don't think that you can really grasp just like, like renewals in any, in, you know, in PNC or Medicare, a lot of times when people are coming into the business, I say, it's hard for you to really understand the power of the renewal right. until you're several years in and you start to feel the wave of what you were doing early on the first couple of years. It's the same thing with hiring people. It's hard to really for me to tell somebody what the effect of having other people on your team is until you pat them for a while. Mm -hmm. right. And then you start right. to see that your entire activity flow, your, you know, I, I call our team as like our apparatus or our net. So if I'm on a fishing boat and I got a big net that I'm catching stuff with, I'm constantly having to grow that net. And it seems like the bigger I get my net, the more fish there are. So I keep having to grow one to work the other. And uh, you know, part of that's just, continuing to work the leads, work the people, work the book, you know, ask for referrals, take care of your customers. And it just keeps growing and growing and growing and advertising. Of course, advertising is just like gasoline on that fire. But I don't know. I just think that there's a lot of business out there and all in every niche, you know, I'm not the guy that's going to tell everybody Medicare is the only way to do it. You know, Medicare, PNC life, it's all good. And uh, there's a lot of business to be had for people that are willing to work hard and build a team and do, the right thing the right way and spend some money because it's going to cost some money to get some people to call you. Is that a two comma club thing on behind you? Yeah. It's my two comma club. Tell us about that. Okay. I yeah. don't know anybody with a two comma club award. Yeah. That's my, uh, my Medicare gurus when actually, uh, that one's from, you know, we do course and consulting for a Medicare agents and we, we recruit, and we're doing that more now, but early on, I wasn't heavily recruiting, just didn't have the time to, you know, spend a fortune of my time writing uh, or, or, or mentoring agents one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, now that we've beefed up our staff, we're able to do that more. But back in the day, I said, well, I still want to help people. And there's a lot of people asking me for help. So I did start creating courses. A couple of those courses collectively did over a million dollars in revenue through ClickFunnels. So Obviously, there's a big demand for the information. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, are you guys writing PNC business too? Give me the breakdown of your agency, how that works. So, we do have a, we did start a PNC side. It's very new. We've probably written, at this point, I'm, you know, puppet master. So, I, I've wow. had somebody else start it in within the office who works for us, and she has probably written 25 PNC policies to date. Um, but we really got into it about October or November. And I haven't really gone after my book yet because I kind of wanted her to get some confidence in it. I'm even considering hiring a captive agent from somewhere else with right. some experience. And now that I have it kind of set up and have them help her take it off you know and let me uh, guess that's a not necessarily a money making I mean obviously you're going to make money but it's a, a a way for you to control that process and that client experience where they don't have to deal with somebody else for their PNC yeah we, we were trying to refer a lot to other PNC agents uh, locally and I wouldn't feel a lot of reciprocal love on the referrals mm. the referrals I were, was getting weren't great and I mean, lifetime residual adds up. We don't need the money right now, but if I can turn it into a long-term revenue stream, mm -hmm. well, as, you, you, well hey, as keeping them in the house. Here's yeah. what you got. You got an acre of diamonds at your feet, right? Your sales proposition to your people that are already on your books or your Medicare products are, hey, would you like to just have one agent? 
mm-hmm. to deal with your insurance needs. To me, I'll make that phone call for you all day long. Give me your 3,000 Medicare people and right. I'll sell 60% of them just on, hey, guys, listen. Convenient. You don't, you don't <laughs> want to deal with five different insurance agents, about five different. Just bring all your stuff over here and let's just yeah. ride it and be done with it. And most of them seem to be with, uh, with as we talk to them, with captive carriers or uh, most of them aren't with independent brokers. It's, right. it's crazy. It's so many of them are around here. Farm Bureau has a ton of them, you know, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and they're not getting like the best rate or anything. They've just been there for a long time. And these, these Medicare clients, the way I see it, it was what we've seemed to be running into with it is we're in a rural area. <laughs> so some of these houses are hard to figure out out there in the middle of nowhere. Right. Um, but then they actually are decent little premiums because, you know, most of these people are homeowners. They're, you know, right. paid their house off. They're homeowners. They normally have two cars. And some of them even will be people that own a couple of rental properties and stuff like that. But it's none of them are, none of our clients, not very few of them are like your whales. Mm-hmm. But we got a lot of middle class solid stable clients and they pay their premiums on bank draft and they pay their premium. Like they're not, yeah. they're, yep. they're, it's the greatest generation, you know, they're, they right. believe in paying their bills. So it, in some ways it's a really good, you know, group. And, and honestly, the elderly kind of generation or senior citizen generation seems like on the PNC side has, has been a group that people hadn't really gone after that mm-hmm. much. I have seen a commercial lately, a TV commercial is some kind of national campaign where they're going after PNC for elderly and they they have like a, a spin on it, but that's like right. the first time I've ever seen it. Well, and it's one of those things too, you know, I look at it like kind of like I look at some of these real estate companies that are now selling insurance and, you know, as insurance agents, we like to not we, but, but some insurance agents like to bash them. And, and granted there's tons of problems with a, with a big national firm, all, real estate firm also selling insurance. But the reason they're doing that is because, insurance agents that they're working with are consistently dropping the ball and they're trying to control that process and they're trying to be that one-stop shop. Like you said, agents around you were dropping the ball. So you have to add that service so you can control that process, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's for us, like the money is like a secondary note on that concept. Cause I, I am trying to keep them in house. I'm keeping my retention higher. And then maybe I'm, I get in the door on the PNC down the road with some of them that I wasn't getting in for Medicare and then I find the Medicare. So I feel like it just kind of all feeds the mothership in the long run. But, you know, I know a lot of independent agents in other States. You don't see this as much in Alabama because blue cross and blue shield over here is just an 800 pound gorilla. You either have it or you don't. That's kind of yeah. how things go here. Oh, blue cross in Alabama is cause we do a little bit in Alabama just cause we're so close to the border. Right. Uh, but, Blue Cross of Alabama definitely is more dominant in Alabama than most states' Blue Cross programs are. Right. Uh, in Mississippi, for instance, Blue Cross is, once people get off of group coverage and go on Medicare, Blue Cross really isn't much of a player here. Right. Uh, but in Alabama, it is the player. So. Well, what I was going to say is I see agents and I know agents in other parts of the U.S. that bring clients in on the PNC side by selling them either Medicare products or health insurance products, kind of that's why they called. And then they get them in the office to talk about those two things. And that always leads to, Hey, by the way, would you like for us to go ahead and quote your home and auto insurance too, while you're here? Yeah. I see that quite often. You don't see that as much here in the state of Alabama as you do in other States. Yeah. Well, that's bringing them in on the pain point. I have friends locally that were like PNC guys, state farm agents and things. And they always talk to me about marketing because we've done a good job on marketing. And of course they're hog tied with corporate stuff with marketing. But when I'm talking to them, like you got to identify a pain point and go after these pain points that people for, for Medicare, it's just an easy identifiable pain point. They're retiring, they're turning 65 and all of a sudden their health coverage changes for the first time in maybe 40 years. Right. So that's a big pain point. And uh, with PNC, there's different ones, but I don't know if there's any as blatant as that 65th birthday. You know, with right. PNC, they'll go after like teenage drivers, but that's harder to identify when that happens because it's different ages for different people. And so, you know, there's PNC probably is 
a tougher sale. So like what you're, you know, I, it's tougher in some ways. I mean, everything's tough in different ways, but if you can identify that pain point and get in front of them for turning 65, help them with the Medicare and then cross sell the PNC, you already got them on the hook. Right. So what is the hardest part to, because a lot of most, I would say 99% of the agents listening to this right now have never sold a Medicare product before. And so if they're, and I'm the same way, I've never sold a Medicare product and we wanted to have you on because we've never talked about the Medicare product that's out there. What's the hardest part about that sale? So most people in the process of becoming certified to do Medicare, they talk about the, the certification process. You have to do a thing called the AHIP, mm -hmm. which is really only for Medicare Advantage and drug plans. So anybody could go and start selling MedSupps with just a health insurance license. Mm -hmm. Almost no other certification to do that. And it would be a pretty clean product to be offering. But if you wanted to go head into Medicare and you just want to say, I'm going to do all the Medicare, Mm -hmm. um, you got to get that little certification process. Not very difficult. It's just like cumbersome, just like sitting down and doing damn CE credits. Nobody enjoys right. doing it, but it's just something that you got to do. Mm -hmm. You get through it, you know, with Medicare, they add that one little layer as far as anything with sales. And this is, you know, when you get people like Cody Askins or somebody that says, why do insurance agents fail? I always have the same answer. It's not getting in front of enough people. But with Medicare, it's the same thing. The toughest thing is getting somebody to, to actually think that you are an authority on something, you know, or that you, or that they should listen to you. But once you can get past that, it's just about simplifying that conversation, simplify the hell out of it. Right. Because the thing about it is Medicare is going to send them a book with 180 freaking pages and they do not need to know all that because okay. I don't probably even know all that. Like it's, it's a bunch of actually some of the stuff in there isn't even accurate and it's made by the government. So you need to simplify it to what they need to know. You figure out a little bit about them, who they are, where they go to the doctor, how they feel about health care, and then based on what you would know about Medicare and the, the couple of different products that are popular in an area, which one is probably going to be the best fit for them, lean into that, pitch it with price and benefits and all that kind of stuff, and then if they buy into it, uh, that's it. You know, I hate to like oversimplify like the sales process, but once you get somebody to listen to you on it, it's just educational and it's, mm -hmm. it's super simple. Most of these guys that are new in Medicare, they learn all of it and they've gotten in their side, their head about how much information there is. And they try to over explain people. And that just mm -hmm. turns people off because most people don't know what the hell you're talking about. Right. Sim that's, simplify. That, that's, Simplification that's, is so important. Yeah, yeah, that's that's insurance sales in general. I mean, I, I, I do. I've always said I am horrible at 99% of things. But one of the areas I am pretty damn good at is when I sit down with someone, I always think to myself, I need to be able to explain this to this person, just like I was describing this to my 13 year old son. Mm hmm. Uh -huh. And I think any time you can do that, especially if you have kids and you've got a kid who's like 10, 11, 12, 13, and you can think of it that way of, you know, I can't be talking up here way above their head because that, and, and I always say this to my agents all the time, losing altitude. I think you lose altitude with people. If you think about it like an aircraft, you're losing altitude when you start doing the whole jargon, legal ease speak and all that. But if you can give real life examples, you know, women feel, men think, men are more visual, giving visual examples. Look out on that road right there. One out of four drivers don't have insurance. Giving those types of examples. When you're talking to women, always say, how do you feel about that? When you're talking to men, how do you, what do you think about that? I think people discount confidence, product knowledge, but product knowledge that can be transferred into telling it to my 13 year old and that visualization and just that overall psychology of sales to people. I think people really discount that. And what I find among most associate agents is they do things one way for 15, 20, 30 years, and they never try doing anything in a different way that if they tried it that way, maybe instead of selling 
$50,000 a month in premium, maybe they'd sell $100,000 a month in premium. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Do you ever find too, this is something that I've found in a sales machine, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with agents, sometimes you'll have an agent that's doing something and he's hitting a home run. Like he's Mm -hmm. selling and he's selling, he's selling, he's cross selling, he's cross selling. And then it's like they change something and it stops selling so well. Right. Sitting with just as many people, but they quit cross selling as much. And it's like they've gotten out of that, out of something, you know what I mean? So it's the like groove, almost like the, the reverse groove. of what you said. Like they'll 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 have something down and then they'll try something else and they'll screw it up too. <laughs> I think well, it's a yeah. complacency. I think it's a, a complacency that could also be confused with laziness, maybe a little bit. I'll tell you guys one way to think of that too. It could be complacency. That's a pretty obvious one when you say, Well, Clint, you only sold $25,000 in premium this month and you're upset and you think you're never going to sell a policy again. Remember this, one week last month you went on vacation. One week last month your wife had some medical issue and you took off for three days. You only worked 13 days in the month of December and now you expect to sell fifty or hundred thousand dollars of insurance or have that commission in January, that ain't how this works. That ain't how right. this works. Yeah. That happens a lot. That mm-hmm. happens a lot. And I always think about that when one of my agents take a week on vacation or a two week uh, honeymoon. And I think, okay, well go ahead and take it, but get ready. March is going to be here before you know it. And you ain't going to have shit on your damn sales tracker because you've been taking off so much. It's like, it's like a water hose. And, you know, all of a sudden you're just going along the water hose. And at some point, if you. And the worst thing you can be in in sales is not confident. I see that in my people from time to time. Something will happen and it'll shake their confidence a little bit. And that gets reflected in them trying to sell moving forward because that little thing in their head. Yeah. It's just different. It's just. A lot of times it's just enough to throw them off so they don't bring things up that they were bringing up before. That's Cause, right. Because I, I, they were bringing it up half the damn battle, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people think, like, oh, you got to be some kind of master salesman. But I found that the people that bring it up sell it <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> so, Justin, I've been reading these books on hypnosis. Yeah. Hypnosis. Of course you have. Which, which, like which the Marshall Silver book. stuff? Yeah, right, right. And so I've been reading these books on hypnosis and I've been watching YouTube videos on hypnosis. Now there's different ways to hypnotize somebody, but to a person, every hypnotist that I have studied so far says rule number one to hypnotize somebody is confidence. Your voice has to echo confidence when you talk to someone that is rule number one that never changes no matter who you're listening to that is a certified hypnotist they will say your voice has to have confidence in it and there's something to that related to sales and people are like dogs they can smell fear and they can kind of smell a lot of times unless you're a damn narcissistic damn psychopath when and i have some friends that are like that they can talk about brain surgery they can talk about construction they don't know shit about it but they can talk about it but most people can kind of recognize when you're bullshitting them. So mm-hmm. that's where that confidence plus the product knowledge and knowing your stuff. I'll tell you who's as good as anybody I've ever seen from a sales standpoint. I've never actually watched him conduct a sale, but I know he's good at it just based on his personality is David Carruthers. Mm-hmm. If you've ever listened to David Carruthers on a podcast, on a webinar, on one of his killing commercial calls, He is one of the most extremely confident people I've ever heard. Now, part of that's personality. Part of that is his, he does have the knowledge to, he knows, he knows what he knows. And I think that goes a long way when he's speaking to a client, either on the phone prospect on the phone or in person, they definitely leave there. Just like all these insurance agents that are joining killing commercial. They definitely think to themselves, this guy knows what he's talking about. Well, I'm currently reading uh, Chris Voss's book. Uh, do you yeah. know Chris Voss? 
never split the difference. Never I've split the difference. And, I, and I say I'm reading it. I'm listening to it on on Audible. But Audible. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, Chris three times. Chris is a former FBI negotiator, highly regarded as the best hostage negotiator in the world. And one of the things he talks about in that book is the late night radio DJ voice. That's right. The warm and soothing and syrupy sweet as easing people's tensions and, and that sort of thing. And I think that comes with confidence. And you actually kind of took me back. I've seen a hypnotist in person, uh, one of those like comedian hypnotists and sat in the front row at Zanies in Nashville, prayers up for Zanies. They actually had a truck drive through their comedy club a couple weeks ago. But when he would start hypnotizing, he'd put his hand on the mic like this and he would be talking like that. And it, it would almost like suck you into his voice. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that every insurance agent in America should be required. Required reading or listening on Audible should be never split the difference with Chris Voss because there is so much of that book that could be – literally, could, that entire book could be translated into insurance sales. My only critique is, is I wish Chris would have read the audio book. I would agree. I would agree the labeling, the mirroring, the, all the stuff that's in that book. And, you know, he was the lead hostage negotiator for the FBI for like, you know, when they had a bad one, he was the guy that they always brought in. But yeah, and I didn't mean to get off track, but I just, I find the Medicare sale. I don't know if it's easier or harder. You would know more about that than I would, because now you've got this P and C side to your business that you can compare and contrast with you've been selling Medicare products for gosh, six, seven, eight years. And so you'll be able at some point to be able to compare and say, okay, that sales a harder sale than this sale. Yeah. I, I think uh, it's probably so far more difficult to beat rates on PNC some, sometimes than Medicare. It's almost like with Medicare, 95% of the time there's a good reason to change and there might be a little bit less of a you know good reason to change on the PNC side so far I mean and that maybe just we're too new to it to know but it does seem like some of these people have good rates wow. and that pisses me off because sure, sure. <laughs> I'm like why aren't you paying too much right, right. yeah <laughs> we want you on our books <laughs> well then, then it boils down to your agent that's selling PNC being able to, if they can get their hands on a deck page, tear that thing apart and make sure that we're comparing apples to apples. Because what we see a lot of times is not a lot of times anymore because we're an independent and we've got so many carriers now, but as a nationwide captive agency, we would win a lot of times just because we'd end up getting a deck page from somebody and we'd say, now, wait a minute, you're telling me you're paying Two hundred dollars less with what you got now. Well, well, you you don't have this. You got a five thousand dollar deductible. You got this, and then, and then they would say, oh, "My God, I didn't know that." And and we could win that way, yeah. Rather than just trying to beat price, uh, which is hard to do when you don't have a deck page and, and nobody ever knows what their coverages are when you talk to them on the phone. They yeah. act like they do, but they don't. Yeah. And and I am pretty much everything I've ever done in insurance. I've been ridiculously young compared to my counterparts. Yep. Uh, when I was hired at Alpha, I was at that time, I believe the youngest agent in the company. I was 23. And I get asked this a lot because we have a lot of uh, younger agents that'll reach out to us from the podcast. And I would say probably three out of every 10 is dealing with some sort of age issue. Like, well, I'm young and I feel, you know, da, da, da. And, and I tell everybody this, and some of them don't believe it, but it's a hundred percent true is that I have never once in my insurance career felt that my age was a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And it's because since day one and, and even more so early part of my career than now, but I made dang sure I knew my stuff. That was how I overcame that. And yep. I made it my mission when I met with that client. I don't do this anymore because we've got a different deal now. But when I was first starting, I was suit and tie every day, not saying you should do that, but I was suit and tie every day. I knew my stuff and I was, I would over prepare. 
Mm-hmm. And you have, to, you have to be self-aware as to where you are. And correct. So I, was telling, I was telling my, uh, my little brothers selling with us now. And I was saying like, I'm not a suit and tie guy, but if I'm 26 and I look really, really young mm-hmm. and I'm trying to compensate for that at the time, you no, know, I might do that. I might like, well, let me just dress up much more professionally to offset it. And the same thing, like while now, sometimes I might rest on my experience level or the fact that a lot of the customers already know who I am from running commercials and things. And I don't even, I won't even have to work as hard for the same sale but lower for me because just by being a young guy, if you're a sharp young guy, the older generation, you know, really likes that because you don't, don't think, think a lot of us. you don't think if I got hired by Northwestern mutual at 24 years old, the first thing I would do before I did anything else, is I would have a suit and tie on every day and I would grow a beard because a beard on a young guy at least takes you up yeah. two or three years. So if you're 24, it might make you look like you're 27 or 28. Yeah. Just like if I was going out to sell farm insurance tomorrow, which I could do and I could make a damn bunch of money doing it because I, those people love me. You don't think I wouldn't have a pair of Georgia boots and some car hearts on when I walked out there and got out of my truck? Are you kidding? You got to know your audience, don't you? I mean, man, all day long, baby. We found out here pretty quickly because we were we weren't going after the the wealthy. We were going after the the middle class, the blue right. collar group, and they don't they wanted me to they don't you don't want to dress like a slob, but right. jeans and a collar shirt, right? Jeans and a sweater that was more up their alley than if I dressed up too sharp. Now, if I, like you said, if I was working at Northwestern Mutual or Modern Woodman, or if I got hired at a company like Alpha that had that corporate kind of thing, I would, I would probably go and dress the part and do their, play my cards right, you know, early on. And I don't think when you're really young, being dressed really sharp is ever going to really hurt you. But if you get really comfortable with it and you have a whole lot of product knowledge uh, and you dress decent, you stay well groomed or, you know, you don't look like a slob and you talk to people like, you know what you're talking about. Sometimes you can come past that. I would find I'd be sitting with, you know, an older man who would be early on might, might be caught off guard by my age. I could just kind of feel it in their face. Yeah. Yeah. And then we would st- we'd sit down and start talking. And as I got into the, you know, the information and I'm really, and he, he could figure out, I know what I mean. I have them all the time tell me, man, you're really sharp, man. You know, I'm glad, I'm glad I found you. You really know what you're talking about. And that always made me feel good and boost your confidence. And then you probably did better the next time. So uh, I just think most people just have to get out there and, and communicate with people and, and find their footing and you get confidence just by talking to more and more people. Hey, so. Let me tell you something. I've been with you now for nearly an hour. Here's one thing I know about Justin. Based on your tone, your tonality, your body language, the way you carry yourself, the way just the way you look and dress, I bet old people ate you up with a biscuit. <laughs> I've I always can, been pretty you, good. With you know people. why? Let me tell you why. I'll tell you why. Why? Because you, you look like everybody's grandson. That's it. I'm the grandson. <laughs> everybody's – you remind me of little Johnny. That, that's what uh, they that's what they used to tell me all the time. Now, they, that's Barbara. Now, that's Barbara's boy now. That, they would say – Yeah. They'd come in, they say, they'd it'd be a husband and wife. And she'd look over and she'd say, don't he look like Jesse? <laughs> Looks just like him. Don't Talks he look like him. Don't he look like him. Billy? <laughs> they'd yeah, say, I, how old are you? And I'd say, at the time, like 26, 27. They're like, well, he's 35. Wow, you're even younger than him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I bet you they ate you up with a biscuit, boy. I can tell. So, it's let's leave this long. podcast, leave these guys with something else they can take back with them and – yeah. Implementing their agency. What are you doing with all these people you're hiring right now? Cause you're still in a hiring mode. How are you training all these people you got selling Medicare products for you right now? With this is a constantly evolving thing, training mm-hmm. and getting people, you know, going, we are trying to do two sales meetings a day, but I'm still very intimately involved right now in my kind of bullpen where they come to me with every question and I'm become that more pivotal person where I'm constantly engaged in it. I also have all the calls 
recorded so I can go back and listen to stuff and drop in and kind of critique a little bit. But most of the time I'm just trying to get involved in it, asking them questions about their day, different things. And, and I'm friends all, I mean, these guys are my best friends. So, right. you know, I mean, it's easy. I want to talk to them about it. They want to talk to me about it. And, uh, and we try to create a culture where, I mean, I apologize to their wives all the time, but most of these guys would rather be at my office hanging out with me and selling insurance than at home. So right. <laughs> we just create, we just try to create that kind of culture. And, and I think that it just makes people want to do better. And I have, I'm very blessed that some of the agents that we hired early on are also really good at training others. They're very generous with their time. I've had guys that one of the guys I hired, he actually came into insurance about the same time as me, but he was a final expense guy. He's real sharp. Another guy has had all kinds of different sales positions before, and then we brought him into insurance. But those guys are help me a lot uh, train, and uh, and you get a culture of sales dudes around each other, and they just kind of geek out on. Mm. on sales and and the product knowledge i mean right. all day long if you ever been around if, if you're in you're in, like in the military i would hang out around pilots and they would talk about i was in aviation but i didn't know what the hell they were talking about because i wasn't a pilot right they could only hang out with pilots mm -hmm. because they were always talking about ickyo codes and et and r and all this goofy crap that i didn't know what they were talking about medicare agents it's like a whole breed, you know, insurance agents in general, I'm going to associate better with other insurance agents because right. we talk about marketing and sales and all that. But then you get me in a room full of Medicare agents, we can talk for hours about mm -hmm. Medicare and training and sales and marketing and all that stuff. So anyway, we just create that culture and, and everybody wants to learn more. So that's how we train. No, I don't think there's a great system. So I don't know if it's replicable. I just say create a good, good culture where people want to learn more and do better. I'm going to leave this podcast with a story. Yes. So when I was 16 years old, I, lived, I grew up in a little town called Hamilton, Alabama. Dry County, surrounded by dry counties. Dry meaning they did not sell alcohol. Well, the closest place that you could buy alcohol was between Hamilton and Tupelo, Mississippi. And I believe it was called, is it Morville or Littleville? Morville is a More, Morville, <laughs> Mississippi. It was about 30 minutes from my house. Now, folks, the reason I'm telling y'all this story is we've been talking about when in Rome, do as the Romans do, right? So we're 16 years old. Well, my best friend was about six foot four, big redheaded boy. All of my friends from back home are all six four, six five, six three. When we walk in a place, it looks like football teams walking in. But he was the oldest. We, we bed different. We chose him because he was the oldest looking one of the 16 year olds. So we all pile up in a Camaro red candy, apple, red Camaro. And we drive over to Morville. Now remember we're 16 years old and we get over to the parking lot at the gas station that sold beer. And I looked at him and I said, Hey, put these Ray-Ban aviator sunglasses on. They'll make you look older. So he puts these Ray-Ban aviator sunglasses on. And leaves the car running and goes into that beer store in Morville, Mississippi. And five minutes later, 16 years old, walks out with a case of Miller Lite. And it was the happiest day of our life that we had <laughs> bought beer at 16 years old. And we were going to go back to Hamilton and drink it. We were ecstatic. And Morville, my, so that, that truck stop that you probably stopped at there, the gas station in Morville to buy it, right. my mother owned it for a while <laughs> are you shitting me <laughs> she might have been the one selling you the beer <laughs> well I, if we violated any uh beverage control laws over there about 1986 i apologize but boy we were <laughs> we were some happy campers coming out when he walked out smiling with that damn that's a that's miller light in his hand hey Thank justin you. are you still in quarantine i know you had a pretty rough bout with covid recently right no i am out of it i've been so i i'm probably two weeks 14 or 15 days out from my positive test I did have some I had a rough bout with it and look I'm not a COVID all I can say is China is on my bad side right now but COVID really had its way with me you know I ain't a shut the whole economy down kind of guy but I will tell you that COVID didn't sit well with me I'm the kind of guy I never get the flu or anything like that 
but I got this and it was, it was down for a couple of days. I'd be, I'd start to come back up and then it felt like I was coming back down again over and over again. So only felt a hundred percent back to normal for about two or three days at this point. I've got one account manager that came down with it last Monday and she has almost been hospitalized twice, although now she's back to nearly normal. And she had the exact same symptoms, or, or she would feel terrible, need to go to the hospital, almost begging her husband to take her to the hospital. And then the next day, she would feel like she's coming out of it. Yeah, 50% better. And then the next day, it'd be back to, hey, I think I need to go to the hospital. Yeah. It's a weird virus, man. I mean, that the taste and smell thing with the, yeah. well, I had the fever and chills for a couple of days. Then I felt like I was getting better. Then I passed out and had to go to the ER. And then, because like an orthostatic blood pressure issue, mm -hmm. I checked out. I didn't have any major things wrong. They had CAT scans, everything. Come home and I start feeling like I'm getting better again. Start doing some stuff, but I'm real winded. Then it, I'm telling you, there's a weird symptom towards the end where I like, it was almost like a, an anxiety disorder or something where it started making me feel like I really, I don't even know how to, like I was pissed off all the time. Like my mood was real messed up mm. and I can't, under, I, I don't know. It, it couldn't have been anything. I've never felt like that. I'm not that guy. I'm, I don't have anxiety at all. I know people that do. I, I know it's a real thing. I don't have it, but I had it at the end of this and I, I had it for a few days like real bad, like I was real pissed off and my moods were changing. And I kept thinking, great, this thing has done some permanent nerve damage. And now mm -hmm. this guy that has zero anxieties will come out of it a permanent, you know, I'm gonna have to go put on clonopin or something. <laughs> Thankfully, I mean, the last two or three days now, I've felt really good. And nothing to let you know how good you feel like feeling like shit for a couple of weeks. Right. <laughs> yep. right. It's kind of like when you get when you get a brain freeze eating ice cream. Oh yeah. You, you feel so good right when it stops. When it stops. Oh yeah, yeah. You yeah, sometimes going and running a dang marathon, you know, you need to know how that feels just so you know you don't want to do it again. <laughs> hey, here's what I've been telling my our audience of 250,000 insurance agents. July 15th, we're pulling out of this. We're all going to have the vaccine. We're all going to be back to normal. You better tell you damn boys and girls selling Medicare, they better put their big girls and boys' pants on July 15th and get ready to go to some people's houses and start selling some Medicare because that's I'm, coming. I, I want it. I'm, I'm positive on it. We're, we're traveling. I'm, we're going to Scottsdale in a couple of weeks. I got some guys actually this afternoon from Wilmington, North Carolina, that have traveled down here. We, we can't stay at home forever. You know, I, right. just, I can't do it. Life ain't worth living if, if we act like that. So. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to shut this thing down. Bradley, you got anything else before I let him go? Nope. All right. Guys, like I always say, rewards come from action, not discussion. We talked about a lot of cool things today. Hope you got something out of the podcast. Get your ass out from behind that desk, especially when July rolls around and everybody's back watching ball games and going to the park and eating in restaurants and going to movies and doing all the, the things that we were doing pre-COVID. We just ordered in our agency – some displays for trade shows and things like that, because that's how sure I am that this thing's going to get back to normal. I want to thank Justin Brock for being with us today, the Medicare guru, and he is a great American. And I just want to say thank you so much for being on here, Justin. Remember this guys, rewards come from action, not discussion. Get your ass out from behind that desk, go out and sell insurance, make money for your family, for your wife, for your kid's college fund, and go make money for your parents who are struggling today and need help. Go do it. Write good business for the agencies that you represent and write good business for the companies that you represent. Bradley Flowers, I love you. Thanks, man. Thanks, Justin. Guys, you are listening to the Insurance Guys podcast, and we love you too very much, and we'll look forward to seeing you back here real soon. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Insurance Guys podcast. If you need to know more about me or you need to get in touch with Scott, you can always reach me at theinsuranceguyonline.com or email me at iprotectins at gmail.com. And if you need to get in touch with Mr. Bradley Flowers, go to bradleyflowersinsurance.com or email him at bradley at saralandinsurance.com. 
Guys, we love you. Thank you so much for listening. We look forward to being with you again real soon on the next episode of the Insurance Guys. Take care.